run away in, we want to stay as a group. No one to run off and pick off. These boys are trying to take us out. Now, our rendezvous at 1837, we'll see the forts approximately at 10 o'clock, 2,000 feet below. We'll join up with them and pick on anything that's picking on them. Now, is that understood? Are there any questions at all? What about the weather situation, sir, at the rendezvous point? Things, faces, friends, places. Years and moments half forgotten. Laughs, fears, songs, tears. Memories are made of this. I remember a time when a trip to Europe was anything but a pleasure. Strictly business. A time when they didn't ask you to come. And a time when you didn't ask to go. You can say that again. And yet you went. Again and again, day after day, all around the clock. I remember the roar of motors over the countryside of Britain, over fields and hedges whose origins you have to look up in Doomsday Book, which for us Americans is way back. Too gentle a countryside for the things of war. Too gentle for barriers to keep you away from green grass, just because it was growing on an airfield. A celebration and a farewell. Farewell to the Memphis Bell. She'd been places, that old flying fortress, and she sure deserved a vacation. So now they were taking her home to the States, and no crew could have been more pleased. A kind of goodwill tour, to tell the folks back there something of what was going on over here. And though we were all green with envy, that didn't stop us from giving her the best send-off an airplane ever had. Yes, a flying, escorted send-off. So long, Memphis Bell, and happy landings. But even without the Memphis Bell, it was business as usual. Remember, our job today is support of bombers. We're to take these bombers into the target and bring them home. Our primary mission is getting there and getting them back. We don't want any of you breaking off going after individual airplanes. That kind of dialogue you could hear any time during those years in Britain, any time around the clock. These are P-38s, lightnings the British called them, leaving for a mission. The RAF would have termed it an op, a wizard prank, whatever that is. But what's in a word? Last summer's crop, the lightnings, fast going out of fashion. But that's the way it is in war. Get used to one type of airplane, and bingo, others come along. Just about then, everything was coming along. New planes and all that goes with them. It was a headache finding space for it all. For Britain is an island, and kind of small. New squadrons needing new fields. And that means hangars, maintenance shops, runways, dispersal areas. Not to mention a little detail of the accommodation for thousands of guys to fly them and keep them flying. 
I tell you, one began to wonder where the British were going to live. And there was even more to it than that. For in the air, there was talk of a second front, of going to Europe, not just on a visit, but for keeps. And so all that a second front takes was fast appearing on the scene. Just where did they put it all? Our part in the overall strategy was round the clock. These are thunderbolts taking off for some other phase of the overall program. Now, where are they going? To shoot up enemy airfields? To beat up his troop and supply trains? Could be. Or maybe it was just to practice, to let fly at trailing targets, just to keep the eye in and the hand sure. Round the clock. Here are medium bombers on another field lining up just about chow time. Just in from visiting French marshalling yards. The boys are snatching a bite while bomb racks are reloaded and tanks refilled for this afternoon's matinee. No union break here. Just eat and run. Hey, remind me to tell you, we had an ace gunnery instructor those days. So unlike Errol Flynn that he must have been... Yeah, that's right. Clark Gable. Certain time, and away they go. Maximum effort, they called it. With the RAF and the US Air Force, the sky of Europe was real crowded. And for those who didn't go, it was always kind of anticlimax. Nothing to do but wait. Unless you had work to do, like the fitters, the mechanics, and the storekeepers. But then they also serve who only stand and serve. Uh-uh. Gambling during duty hours is forbidden. I said gambling during duty hours. Okay, okay, so I can go fly a kite. Go fly a kite or ride a bicycle over to quarters. Well, those fields were so big, walking was out, unless you wanted to arrive after sundown. Off duty hours for some. Furlough for the lucky few. Time to see something of a land very different from home. Yet... Kind of the same in many ways. Just a question of accent, if you get what I mean. Even in a Britain at war, you could find relaxation, same as at home. Whether you've got a pound on its nose or a couple of bucks, a horse can be just as unreliable any place in the world. What else did you do? You might have joined the war workers watching a football game. Exciting, too, when you caught the drift. They had to kick the ball into kind of a net. But if they got their mitts on it the way we do, brother, they were cooked. And then, uh-oh, on this subject, I'm just not opening my trap. No, sir, no sticking my neck out. No, sir. Well, all right, one teeny-weeny hint. If you so much as holler kill the umpire in this game, then you really are cooked, but definitely. <laughs>